Hi everyone, my name is Anami Nguyen and this is a virtual version of a presentation I gave in February 2020. It is now August 2020, um, so please bear that in mind when I talk about current events or use up-to-date memes. They're probably not current anymore. Um, so this presentation is about cypherpunks and Bitcoin billionaires, why women should get uh, involved and conquer crypto. Um, I will be talking about crypto history, how it works briefly, what are those cypherpunks, how did those Bitcoin billionaires come about, and why and how you can get involved. So to start off, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Anami Nguyen, as I said, and I'm originally from Germany, but I studied finance and management at NYU Stern in New York, in the U.S., um, which is also where I learned first about Bitcoin. And this was really what got, my, uh, got me interested uh, in this whole industry, in this whole movement. I had a professor uh, in a fintech class called Professor Sabrina Howell, and she taught us how Bitcoin works, and I think that's really what got me. Um, before that, I wasn't that interested uh, because I simply didn't know how it, under how it works, and I didn't understand what its potential was. Um, yeah, so I learned about uh, crypto and I was really interested in it, but I had already signed an offer to work for JP Morgan Private Bank after graduating. So that's what I ended up doing. I worked at JP Morgan Private Bank in Switzerland as an analyst uh, for about a year. And then um, just like the crypto bug caught me and I didn't want to stay. I wanted to work in crypto. So I left um, and figured out where and how I wanted to position myself in the industry with no um, software engineering or cryptography uh, background and I ended up managing the finances and assets of the Web3 Foundation um, which is the foundation behind the Polkadot network, a new network that is I think uh, launching soon uh, by the founder of e Ethereum which is the second most popular uh, cryptocurrency and I stayed there for also about a year um, and then moved to Berlin due to personal reasons and in Berlin, I joined Neufund, which at the time was doing, um, was helping people invest in private companies using crypto. They were on the Ethereum blockchain. I don't want to go too much into the technology, but it was also crypto related. And I was doing business development for them. And currently, you can find me at Lacewing Tech, which is a small startup here in Berlin too, working on giving people access to private, secure, and um, sus sustainable uh, cloud solutions. And I'm also doing business development for them. Yes, so that's on me, and let's get started. So what is this magical internet money? Crypto, cryptocurrencies, how does it work? Um, I think it's important that we have a little bit of a baseline of understanding what's behind um, the hype. I will be talking now about Bitcoin because it's basically the foundation for the entire crypto industry. Without Bitcoin, we probably wouldn't have gotten to where we are that quickly. And it's also um, because it's the first and kind of foundational cryptocurrency uh, for where we are at today, um, a lot of its concepts also apply to most of the other cryptocurrencies. All right, so if we want to understand how Bitcoin works, we need to understand how traditional money transfers work. Um, traditionally, um, if A wants to send B $1, um, they will go to a bank and have their identity verified, for example, by logging in uh, to their online banking and using two-factor authentication using their password. So they log into their online banking, they tell the bank, hey, I want to send a dollar to B, I'll type in the information, and then the bank verifies uh, that A has enough money on their account and then records the information that A has now a lower balance and B has a higher balance. So the bank is the intermediary um, to basically record that somebody in the end has less money and somebody else has more money. A money transfer has happened. Um, and that's the same duty that Bitcoin has. So with Bitcoin, A wants to send B uh, one Bitcoin, which is, um, as some of you may know, way more than one dollar uh, these days. Um, and A, uh, instead of going to the bank, um, 
returns to the Bitcoin network and tells the Bitcoin network, I want to send one Bitcoin to B. And instead of a bank uh, account number or IBAN in Europe, um, B will give a an address. So it's basically like an international bank ad account number that works everywhere. And it's equally um, unreadable as the emoji sequence that I put there, Rose Taxi uh, Moon. Um, but obviously it's not an emojis, not now, not yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, so A uh, basically, um, A signs the transaction um, by using their private key, which a private key is a similar thing as a password to confirm their identity. Um, and it's um, cryptography with which we confirm a identity here. It's not the bank that does any checks. Um, and A sends the transaction information to the Bitcoin network, as I said. Um, and the network is basically a bunch of different parties, entities, so they can be people or companies um, that, um, that all store all of the transaction information that has ever happened in the Bitcoin network, in the Bitcoin world, independently. So everybody, each one of these, as we can maybe imagine, computers, um, stores all of that information, all of the transaction information. And therefore, the, because of this like, decentralization element, um, there's an increased amount of transparency and every, anyone who has all of this information, so any full node, as we call them, any computer who has downloaded all of the transactions, transaction information can confirm whether A has enough balance to send to B so that A cannot um, send money without having it. Um, and then um, let's say the Bitcoin network confirms and says, yep, uh, A has enough money. And then they record the transaction. They record that A has a lower uh, um, balance now and B has a higher balance. And it's a similar result to with the traditional banking system. The people who, or people, or entities or parties who do this work of checking whether A has enough balance and uh, logging the transactions and you know doing putting in all of this work, they're called miners. Um, and I will get to it a little bit later and why they're called miners. But I think for now, it's also really important that we answer the question of how do we know that these miners don't include invalid transactions? Like Bitcoin is worth a lot. Why doesn't a miner just say, um, no, actually, A sent a million Bitcoin to me, not to B. Um, the reason why they're deterred from this kind of um, bad behavior is that there is a consensus mechanism. And a consensus mechanism is um, a protocol that forces the miner to put skin in the game uh, when they want to participate in the network. Um, and it's called consensus mechanism because it helps all of, all of the different nodes, all of the different uh, parties in that network reach consensus um, because they're independent, uh, they don't trust each other, um, they need to somehow verify that each other's information is valid and they need to reach a consensus on what is the state, um, the current state of the Bitcoin world. So how much, um, how much Bitcoin does A have? How much Bitcoin does B, C, D have? Um, they all need to be on one page regarding that. And with Bitcoin, the consensus mechanism is called proof of work. Um, and other, uh, other cryptocurrencies rely on different consensus mechanisms, uh, but this is the most popular one so far. And proof of work um, requires the following things. The miner um, who does the work of confirming that A has enough balance on their account, <laughs> Uh, which there's no such thing, but on their account, let's just call it like that, um, they need to then propose to the rest of the network um, to add this transaction. And they take a bunch of these transactions, they bundle them up in a block, 
that then they propose to add to the blockchain. So the reason why you hear the word blockchain a lot is because it's, it's like a chain of records that's sequential um, of different blocks and all of these blocks have a certain amount of transaction information in them. So whenever a miner wants to propose, hey, um, could you all add this next blog? Um, I want this block to be part of the blockchain in the next sequence. They have to solve a mathematical puzzle that requires a lot of energy. So it is solvable, um, but they have to spend money on buying hardware and on electricity in order to solve this puzzle. And after they have solved this puzzle, they will be able to propose the new block. So this is supposed to hinder somebody who has uh, no skin in the game um, to propose just any block with uh, faulty or empty transactions. Because if they have already spent all of this real-life money on acquiring this hardware and energy, um, it's going to be really rough for them if they propose a block with a bunch of faulty transactions and the rest of the network says, no, this is wrong, we're not going to accept this next block as part of the blockchain. And, they're just going to use, lose that money. So it's kind of like an economic incentive of doing the right thing. Uh, using also cryptography also, because I was talking about these mathematical puzzles. Um, they're, they're made with cryptography. And, um, so, yeah, so basically what happens is that when they solve the block, they propose, uh, they solve the puzzle, they propose the next block, and if it's fine and looks fine to the rest of the network, the rest of the network shows the, that they agree um, by also adding this block to their, um, to their transaction record, to their blockchain. Um, and this is how they all agree on whether something is correct or not. Um, so I was talking earlier about mining and miners. Uh, miners are called miners because they are the ones who create new Bitcoin. Um, whenever they do this work of um, proposing a new block, once it is accepted, as a reward, they're allowed to add some Bitcoin that they can send to their own address, to their own account. So for them, that's like another economic incentive to have their block be accepted um, because they will then receive Bitcoin. And Bitcoin can only be created through this process. So this is why they're called miners. It's the same as going to a gold mine and digging up new gold. Um, as a reward for doing the work of mining the gold, you get to keep some of it. Um, so that's why they're called like that. Um, and this is a very um, high level overview of how Bitcoin works. Uh, I will talk later about resources if you want to learn more. But I mentioned a few of important words and concepts um, so that we can be on one page when I continue talking about why it's so interesting. <laughs> so why is it so interesting? Uh, what are the benefits here? I'm going to move myself a little bit. Um, I was mentioning cryptography a lot. Cryptography is there in cryptocurrencies in order to provide security, to provide autonomy, that you don't have to rely on anyone else um, for, let's say, um, validating, your, um, validating your identity, validating that you're allowed to send, spend the money of a certain um, address slash account. Um, there's the element of decentralization that I talked about. So all of the different nodes could be all around the world and they're communicating, but they all have um, the in all the information that they need, which, uh, d which means that there's no intermediary. It's supposed to be more fair than having just one bank and that one bank hoards all of the information and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, and they're basically the ones doing all that work. So here it's a little bit um, supposed to be more scattered. And then the last element is crypto economics. I was talking about economic incentives um, in cryptocurrencies. Crypto economics is suppo also supposed to provide security and it's supposed to provide the right incentives for a large amount of people to do the right thing. Um, so 
you know, receiving a reward for doing work is and it's economic incentive. And in crypto in cryptocurrencies, um, you mix uh, cryptography as a tool and economics as a tool, and um, hopefully you will get the right results, which you don't always do. Um, but with Bitcoin, so far it's worked uh, quite well in certain aspects. I think those are very important concepts for us to all know. Uh, before we move on a little bit to talk about crypto history. Okay, I'm in that picture again. I don't know where to put myself here. All right, crypto history. This is going to be also very high level because I don't want to go too much into detail. It's very interesting, but it's also very recent. So crypto history starts, I would say, with modern cryptography. Modern cryptography emerged during the First and Second World War, so in the first half of the 20th century, um, which was part of um, military work and spy agencies trying to decrypt um, the opposing party's communication. Um, people say that mathematical cryptography started around 1945, which was the end of World War II, and uh, a very well-known figure um, that's been talked about in Hollywood and everywhere is Alan Turing, who was a crypto analyst during World War II. Um, and I wrote a gay icon um, because, uh, yeah, you can read more about that. But uh, it's also an interesting, more human factor to a person who's seen mostly as just a, um, a cryptographer. So... Um, that was the start of modern cryptography, which enabled us to do the things that we're doing today. I'm going to skip forward to the 1980s and 1990s. Um, two important figures were Wei Dai, who was the creator of B Money. B Money um, was something like a um, pre-Bitcoin. It was you were you were able to create and send money using solving computational puzzles and it was supposed to have a decentralized consensus mechanism um, just like the consensus mechanism proof of work that I mentioned earlier but it wasn't really yet very clear how to implement and scale that it was definitely um, very revolutionary and Wei Dai is somewhat of an elusive figure who I couldn't find a picture of on the internet very easily. Another important figure was Cynthia Dwork um, she, together um, with Moni Naur, invented uh, proof of work, so the consensus mechanism that Bitcoin and a lot of other cryptocurrencies currently use. Um, these uh, people and these concepts were the foundation for blockchain. Um, yes. Skip forward to the 2000s. I want to talk about Bitcoin again because it is... Um, the um, the first the first cryptocurrency that became lar so popular and started the crypto movement as we know it today. Um, so on the thirty first October of two thousand eight, Satoshi Nakamoto, who until today is not known, uh, we don't know their identity. Is it a man, a woman, a non-binary person? Is it a group of people? We still don't know, and I'm very happy about that, actually. Um, and they released a white paper that uh, detailed uh, Bitcoin. And with that was basically the birth of blockchain, which is what I described to you earlier, the chain of uh, blocks that hold transaction records. Uh, what was important here and what was different was that Satoshi Nakamoto innovated um, the previous crypto cryptographically secured chain of blocks. Uh, so there were like rudimentary concepts of these things, uh, but Satoshi Nakamoto um, cr put them together in such a way that they have never been. And I think something very important to talk about with the birth of Bitcoin was maybe you have noticed that the white paper was released in fall 2008, which also uh, was um, the start or the height of the financial global financial crisis. So the white paper was released in fall 2008 and on January on the 3rd of January 2009 the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain was mined was created 
And in it was embedded um, the following quote. The Times, 3rd of January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So in the very foundation of Bitcoin, in the very first block, is embedded a text that is supposed to um, point to the failure of the centralized banking system. It is a criticism of the financial uh, crisis. It is a criticism of a centralized banking system. Um, and it's supposed to create a alternative system that doesn't rely on a central bank and doesn't rely on the current financial um, superpowers. And we not only know that through this quote from the Genesis blog, but also through uh, emails that were sent between Satoshi Nakamoto and other um, people who were involved in Bitcoin early on. So I think this is really important to keep in mind because um, it paves a lot of the way um, for how the crypto industry was shaped after that. Another important um, historical event uh, that I want to talk about is the start of Ethereum, the second, the currently second most popular cryptocurrency. Um, fast forward till 2015, the Genesis block is mined um, and Ethereum starts. Ethereum is different from Bitcoin um, by a bunch of ways. I think currently the most interesting debate is um, when the new consensus mechanism, proof of stake, is going to be launched. Um, in the Ethereum community, but what was um, historically um, also important about Ethereum was that it was smart contract based um, and you were able to run applications on it. The creators of Ethereum are numerous, um, self-proclaimed or um, elected by others, but I think the most important figures were Vitalik Buterin and Gavin Wood who wrote the white and yellow paper for Ethereum and were involved throughout the process. There are also still very important figures in the Ethereum Foundation. Um, I also want to talk about something interesting that happened. Um, Ethereum, the, the creation of Ethereum was finan financed by a crowd sale. Um, so maybe you have heard of the word um, ICO. The ICO is an initial coin offering. It's supposed to mimic the traditional finance word IPO, initial, in, uh, initial public offering. But an ICO is supposed to be something similar like that just in the cryptocurrencies world. Uh, what Ethereum did was not exactly an ICO, but it kind of laid the groundwork for a lot of other um, people and companies to launch their own ICOs to fundraise in order to then get their um, networks going and to fund the, the development of them. So how it works was that specifically with Ethereum, um, you could, um, how do you say, you could commit Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was already very popular in 2015. Well, it was already quite popular in 2015. You could commit Bitcoin and then um, it would be it would be um, it would give you the it would give you ethereum once the ethereum network would launch so there are a bunch of um, so the software that was written would lock your bitcoin that you committed let's say i want to commit one bitcoin and then in exchange uh, when ethereum launches i get 200 ethereum those uh, proportions are not correct. I'm just using them for illustrative uh, purposes. Um, and so this way they crowd sailed um, the development for Ethereum. And a lot of other companies did that afterwards. People were investing a lot in ICOs. You might have heard of, about them in the news. There are a lot of scams. But they also enable a lot of people to receive a lot of money through non-traditional methods. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and that's uh, it for crypto, a brief crypto history. Um, there's much more to think and talk about. I think those are very important events. Um, you can do some more research with the resources that I will tell you about later. I would like to move on to crypto culture. One moment. This is not a problem in real life presentations. Um, <laughs> having to move my face. Crypto culture. Um, so I was already talking about the criticism for 
central banks, uh, about the ICO craze, but let's dive deeper. Cypherpunks. I, this was one of the main themes of what I promised in the title of this presentation. And I would like to explain to you what it means. So cypherpunks were a group of people in the 1990s, mainly in the US, who, um, whose values were freedom and privacy, and they used encryption as a mean to defend these values, which was the freedom for privacy. Um, a very popular um, piece of writing was the Cypherpunks Manifesto by Eric Hughes um, that you can also look up. It's, uh, it's quite interesting to read. It's very short. And I think one, of, uh, one important quote from there is that um, he said that we must defend our own privacy. And it kind of shows the spirit of um, the Cypherpunk movement being very DIY and very political. Um, so the cypherpunks don't rely on anyone else for providing them with the cryptography, with the um, software to defend their own privacy, for defend their own um, right to communicate privately without the U.S. government spying on them, but they would do it themselves. And the word cypherpunk comes from two words. One is cipher, which is the algorithm that performs D or encryption. And then cyberpunk, which is a sci-fi genre. So it's kind of like, you can see, it's kind of like futuristic. Like you have the cyberpunk element and cypher, which is like the kind of nerdy <laughs> encryption uh, focused element of it. Um, and it was very much anti-establishment, anti-centralization, um, anti-trusting the government. Um, and I think like the freedom for privacy was really the highest principle. Um, so I think for cypherpunks, it didn't matter whose privacy they were protecting um, as long as privacy was granted to everyone. And they're a bit of crypto anarchists, which is also a term that's uh, quite popular in the industry um, that I don't want to dive too deep into. But a few cypherpunks who you might know are Julian Assange from WikiLeaks, Bram Cohen, who created BitTorrent, Hal Finney, who created PGP, um, Zuko Wilcox O'Hearn, who created Zcash, which is another popular cryptocurrency that's very privacy focused, or um, Jacob Applebaum, who created Tor, which is a uh, browser that you can browse the dark web, for example, with, um, and that you're more uh, private and safe with than most browsers that we use. So those are a few people um, of the cypherpunk movement. A lot, of, a lot of people nowadays also call themselves cypherpunks, um, and they're usually in a similar demographic um, as those um, white men that I just mentioned, um, which is also, yeah, it's interesting uh, who, who these things are. Um, attract um, when it comes to like a value standpoint, but I think we all benefit from PGP and WikiLeaks. Um, another, another thing about crypto culture is libertarianism that I have to talk about uh, because it is very relevant and it's very true that there is an overlap between libertarians and crypto holders, for example, or values of libertarians and values of um, people who are in the crypto industry or movement. So Satoshi Nakamoto wrote, it, Bitcoin, is very attractive to the libertarian viewpoint if we can explain it properly. It doesn't mean that Nakamoto is a libertarian, it just means that there are overlapping values. I think um, I've looked at a bunch of studies that were looking at the demographics um, and the politics of crypto holders in the US mainly and um, higher the average of people who would respond that they are libertarians or they identify on the like libertarian spectrum um, was pretty high in comparison to the average American, um, and I think that's due to the um, due to the privacy and due to the kind of like maybe anti-government. Um, features that crypto has and that cryptography and the cypherpunk style has. Um, however, cypherpunks and libertarians are not necessarily the same at all. 
um, I would say that cypherpunks are more like in an anarchist direction, whereas um, libertarians more often are quite often non, um, not related to any U.S. party, because libertarians are mostly, I think that's an American cultural phenomenon, but more often a Republican than Democrats, for example. Whereas the cypherpunk, I don't know where they would identify um, on that, uh, in that bi-party system. Um, yeah, now on from libertarianism to actual liberty. What you can see here on the slide is an excerpt from a letter that uh, Yue Shin wrote um, and that was saved on the Ethereum um, blockchain. So Yue Shin is an activist or was an activist. I'm not sure about her fate right now, but she was an activist at the university that she was studying at in China where she was lobbying for the uh, university government to release um, data about what had happened um, to another female student 10 years prior who ended up um, committing suicide. She, she, started, she complained, I think, about a, process, about a professor uh, sexually assaulting, raping her, and then ended up um, being bullied and um, suicidal. And Yue Shin was inquiring into this, and uh, it was uh, sort of happening during the Me Too movement um, when she released a letter asking for the release of data about these incidents. It was immediately censored on uh, WeChat and other Chinese media. Um, and so she, or somebody else, we don't know, uh, saved uh, this... Um, letter that she wrote on the Ethereum blockchain, which is possible in a sort of, you know, when you make a bank transfer, there's a little comment section where you can write a comment about your transfer. And she saved the metadata on an empty transaction on the Ethereum blockchain in this sort of, com uh, in this sort of like comment section. And actually you can find it um, when you go and um, browse the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so I think this is a more practical and real um, use of uh, cryptocurrencies, of the of blockchain for um, political and for actual like freedom movements uh, than maybe what libertarians are up to, um, and it's one of the few I would say examples, but also important to note that it is part and it's embedded in um, crypto is that it's not sensible uh, because everyone has stored um, all of the transactions. Um, the government can't just make everyone delete all that data, especially since it's international, um, while there is a centralized maybe element to WeChat um, where their censorship is very much uh, possible. Um, censorship was not possible on the Ethereum blockchain and her letter will live on forever there. So I was already talking about censorship and freedom and how cryptocurrencies and blockchain are, um, have certain theoretical benefits like censorship resistance because of the decentralization and because of the element that you cannot reverse transactions on the blockchain. Um, another two interesting um, theoretical benefits are that crypto is trying to uh, combat financial exclusion. So, for example, in the U.S., um, the credit system excludes many millions of people from participating in the financial system due to um, classes and races and other um, awful practices. And crypto is hoping to be um, more neutral than that and to be um, able to be used by anyone. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat. Um, and another theoretical benefit is that um, cryptography, the cryptography element and the consensus mechanism element 
of um, cryptocurrencies are supposed to eliminate blind trust. So you don't need to trust your bank. Uh, well, you do need to trust your bank when you make a transfer because you trust them with everything that you have, all your data, um, that they're going to do the right thing. And theoretically, when you use Bitcoin, you don't need to trust anyone because everything is agreed upon in the software. And I'm saying always theoretically because in reality there is trust. Like you have to, you unless you have like the skill and the time to read um, the entire protocol um, and all of that work, and you know how to do that and you know how to interpret that, um, you do have to trust some people, right? And you, you know, for example, if you want to be part of the um, if you want to own crypto, most people will not um, mine in order to get crypto. They don't have that kind of capacity. Um, they will probably buy it from Coinbase. So they do need to trust Coinbase in the end. Um, so yeah, blind trust is still something that has to happen as it does in most um, circumstances. Um, but uh, what crypto is trying to do is reduce that. So I was already talking about how a lot of these benefits are theoretical. Um, and now I want to segue into um, crypto trading and the money aspect of crypto, which is very important. And what is what gave crypto um, worldwide or, um, yeah, probably worldwide, worldwide recognition and interest. People started trading um, cryptocurrencies a lot. Prices spiked and media attention came. As you can see here on this chart, this is the exchange rate between Bitcoin and US dollars. Um, it's pretty flat the first few years and then 2017 it spikes. Um, I can't tell you why exactly, but probably partially due to ICOs um, and partially due to just how things suddenly become famous. Um, yeah, so I don't want to comment too much on this uh, graph uh, because that's not what we're here for. But I think the volatility aspect and, you know, the high prices were something that really uh, got a lot of attention and attracted a lot of people. So I think a lot of people nowadays who are in this industry are probably more on the crypto trader um, and finance side than on the crypto anarchist and cypherpunk side. Talking about money, these are um, the Forbes richest in cryptocurrency. So these people are billionaires or millionaires either by holding crypto or th through crypto because they're part of that industry. And when we, besides being very homogenic, when you look at them, um, they also have an interesting background, namely, as you can see the bottom half, most of crypto uh, Forbes richest um, were either investors or made their money from creating a crypto exchange. So it's very trading and investing and finance heavy. And only the fewest have made their money through mining, as you can see in the orange um, slice. And mining is basically the backbone of the entire crypto system. If nobody is mining, there is no blockchain. There is no new Bitcoin. Nobody's doing the important work to uphold this network. So it's really interesting to see that the most important, the cr most crucial part um, of crypto is made the fewest people rich. Um, the other um, slices on the top part of this pie chart are... Um, different cryptocurrencies that were invented. So those were the founders and investors in them. And if we look at the backgrounds of those Bitcoin billionaires or crypto millionaires, um, most of them, as you can see in the red part of the size uh, of the pie chart, have a background in finance um, or were part of Silicon Valley or were entrepreneurs. Um, it's kind of, a very similar background, I would say, because uh, Silicon Valley type of entrepreneur is uh, not much different in my personal experience than a finance uh, person, given their status and school they went to and the kind of 
socioeconomic backgrounds they have. And uh, one uh, highlight here is that one person, their background is simply being an heir. <laughs> so I think that was very interesting. Um, yeah, something else um, that's interesting, I think, is here this Forbes cover of Crypto Secret Billionaire Club. And here you can see um, CZ, which is a short for the this uh, guy who founded Binance, which is, I think, currently the biggest uh, crypto exchange in the world. And the ambience of the cover is very secretive, like, ooh, why cryptography? Uh, <laughs> Um, this is, you know, kind of with the hoodie, like, I don't know, Silicon Valley um, used to be portrayed as this, like, young, anti-mainstream person when in reality CZ has a finance background, actually. Um, it's finance software engineer background. But I think the reality of crypto billionaires looks less like CZ on this cover and more like this meme um, of old white guys laughing their asses off because... They made yet another good investment from the money that they already had. Um, and that's not fun, I think. <laughs> it's not the direction that I would like crypto to go to, where people who have a lot of money continue making a lot of money. I mean, this is kind of how the world works, but this was not supposed to be with Bitcoin. Like, that was not uh, why it was founded. Um, there is some hope in this, I think, because the crypto industry is very young. As I told you, like, I would say the very roots of it were in 2008 when the white paper uh, of Bitcoin was released. So that's really only 12 years ago, uh, maybe 11 years ago that Bitcoin uh, was even launched. Um, and we, have, we can do a lot in the crypto industry. So if I would compare crypto startups to internet startups, crypto startups are baby Yoda, and internet startups are several thousand years old Yoda. Um, you, you know, like I think in mainstream media, tech startups are always like these young, hip, cool, new, uh, maybe a little bit anti-establishment things, but in reality they're like um, cash cows and crypto startups are extremely new. Um, I've worked in a few of them and it's very possible to shape and influence this industry when you get in early. There's not that many experts. We don't even know that much about crypto yet. We don't even know how, what works, what doesn't work, what's the best way. We're still innovating. People are still doing research. Um, people are still learning. So I think it's relatively easy to go in and have an influence um, and to be perceived as an expert because nobody else really um, knows that in depth what they're doing except for maybe a few academics. But even those uh, don't really know that much. So I think it's very hopeful that crypto is such a young industry. And that was also the reason why I went into it uh, when I did, when I was uh, tired of banking. <laughs> And um, after this grim picture of all these uh, mostly white male uh, crypto millionaires and billionaires, I would like to go to something more fun, which is, uh, I think, the future, namely women in crypto. Uh, the next few slides will be um, some women who I just wanted to show you and highlight in different uh, parts of crypto. So either they have different roles within a crypto company or they have different roles within society, but they're still um, mostly working in the crypto industry. Or at least at the time that I was holding the presentation in February 2020, they did. So here's um, a bunch of, not me, <laughs> here's a bunch of women um, in crypto who are in finance. They're VCs or investors. Well, yeah, they're investors mostly, or they're part of an exchange, which is also you know, a trading finance um, industry. Then there's a lot of women who are researchers, who have done groundbreaking research, some of who uh, used to be my colleagues, which I'm very proud of. Um, they're amazing women. There's a lot of women who work on crypto projects. So those are like startups or foundations who started um, became entrepreneurs or leading organizations um, and they're also very inspirational and of course there are women who do completely other things there are experts in journalism that are academics um, that do accelerators or practice law um, that are in nonprofits so I think um, it's very interesting because there's a lot of women in crypto and in the end 
um, we need to decide on who we want to feature, who do we want to empower, uh, who do we want to be part of this nascent industry, who do we want to, who do we want this industry to shape. And in the end, the question of who is Satoshi Nakamoto, as I said earlier, has still not been solved. As I'm here, this is Catherine Nicholson from Block Cipher, who's wearing this T-shirt, and I think you know she's probably not Satoshi. She said she's not, um, but she is showing that we can all be Satoshi. We can all be the next big innovator and influencer in the space, and I think that's very exciting. So I would like to continue talking about what's next. So, okay, now you're interested, hopefully, in this industry, in this movement. What do you do? So I suggest the following. Um, you can learn more if you're not already very knowledgeable or do continuous um, education. You can learn how to use crypto and then you can make money, secure the bag, uh, with crypto. So learning, I have these um, resources here for books, for white papers. White papers are um, kind of like mimicking academic papers and describing the theory behind the practice about certain cryptocurrencies. You can read short introductions. Uh, so for example, I have written an introduction to crypto economics, which you can find on my Medium if you look my name up. Um, and you can listen to podcasts, which I really like doing to stay up to date. Uh, Laura Shin has an excellent, has two excellent podcasts and has a very, well, she's a really good journalist point, but she's focusing on uh, crypto. That's really interesting. You can stay up to date by reading news and newsletters. I also learned a lot just by finding out what I don't know when I read the news and newsletters. Um, you can come to events. Maybe nowadays they're a little bit more um, virtual, but they're still happening. And you can start investing in crypto, and that's also how you can learn. So I don't want to tell you what to buy, how to invest. Um, I personally um, have er owned crypto on and off. I have been buying and selling it. Uh, I don't do day trading myself. If you want to, um, that's great, but please do your research. So I have, mess I have written here Misari and Etherscan, for example. Um, Misari is a platform which uh, delivers you data about the prices and the backgrounds of certain cryptocurrencies. And Etherscan is uh, something like a browser for the Ethereum blockchain. So you can, um, you would use Etherscan, for example, to look up um, the Me Too text from US Shin that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then you can buy crypto on Coinbase and Binance, for example. Those are the most popular ones. Um, you can also find alternatives to them, obviously. Um, and then when it comes to events and organizations, I know of um, these three um, awesome women in blockchain um, organizations that also host events. I don't know what they're doing currently during uh, Corona times, um, but you can also check them out on their website. And as the next thing, I suggest that you start using crypto and that's how you can learn about it. That's what I also did in addition to learning about it theoretically is that you can create a wallet. So a wallet is something like a bank account in crypto world. Um, you can use the centralized apps. Um, we're in a very different place today that we were just a year ago when it comes to decentralized apps, dApps. Um, you can go and use, uh, like how is it called, uh, prognosis, um, betting markets, and um, all kinds of other things. You can send crypto to your friends, to yourself, you can donate crypto. I like to donate to give directly, for example, and you can play around with test nets for free. Test nets are... Um, kind of like sandboxes you can play around with that mimic the current blockchain, um, but where you have no real life consequences. So you can get free crypto and learn how to send it and learn how to mine in there. Um, I, uh, I would like to play around with the Polkadot test net uh, called Kusama because that's uh, something that I'm personally interested in given that I've worked for that company. Um, but you can do that for Bitcoin, Ethereum and any other cryptocurrency you can find, any other serious cryptocurrency you can find. Um, and you can make money through crypto. That's possible too. So how? Uh, for example, you can do bounty hunting, you can secure grants and find more ways that all these 
um, crypto foundations give money. Um, you can look them up on GitHub. So for example, if you look up the Web3 Foundation or the Polkadot Network or Ethereum Foundation on GitHub, um, they will have a, bunch, a bunch of bounties up there. They will have descriptions about their grants. Um, I don't know how it is currently, but even just two years ago, you could um, receive, um, receive money or crypto from these organizations for the most uh, diverse set of skills. So as a software engineer, obviously, um, depending on what you're focused on, this might be relevant to you, but we also gave out, so when I was part of the Web3 Foundation, there are people simply organizing events uh, for our network and they would also receive um, bounties and uh, re re compensation for their work. Um, then you can mine, validate, and stake. Val validating and staking is um, something similar to mining in a different type of consensus mechanism. It's basically, um, it's what I just explained earlier. It's the same as mining. Um, so you can do that in the test nets, as I said earlier, or in real life that involves some more um, money investment up front. Uh, but you can make money through that. Uh, you just have to do your research on whether it's worth it for you. Or you can get a job in the crypto industry, for example, through a website like CryptoJobsList.com. That's what I did, and it helped me learn a lot about the industry and get involved and become part of it. Um, I think it doesn't end here. You can all. I think something that we need the most is more, more entrepreneurs and more visionary thinkers that are not just money uh, incentivized in the industry. So I think the biggest value we've gotten was out of um, serious people doing serious new projects. Um, and actually wanting to improve the status quo um, through them. So if you are entrepreneurial or you want to be, um, there's really a lot of space in the crypto industry. It's not like in, let's say, um, the SaaS uh, software as a service industry where you, know, you have all kinds of SaaS companies and it feels so oversaturated. Um, crypto is really not there yet at all. So you have a lot of opportunities um, to, uh, to create something new. And I think that would be amazing. And if you do, please let me know. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter or via email. And you can just Google me and find my contact. Um, and I would love to stay in touch and um, hear any questions that you might have about this presentation. Thank you so much for listening.